Hi, everybody. My name is Lillian Singh, and welcome to our webinar. I'm the first Asian American female judge in Northern California, and I'm the moderator for this important panel. Our topic today is the perils, the dangers of warrantless surveillance under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, and the case for FISA reforms. This is extremely complicated topic involving global politics, legal issues, such as search and seizures, national and racial discrimination, and a host of other issues. And we only have 70 minutes. And we have four speakers, three of whom are lawyers. So it's gonna be a challenge. And we may only be able to scratch the surface, but we will try our best. Before we hear our panelists, I would like to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, the Honorable Congresswoman Pamela Jayapal. Congresswoman Jayapal is the first South Asian American woman elected to the United States House of Representatives. She is serving her fourth term in Congress, representing Washington's 7th District. She has dedicated her entire career fighting for civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy rights for all individuals. Let's now hear from our esteemed Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. I'm Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, and I'm proud to represent Washington's 7th Congressional District in the House of Representatives, where I also serve as the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Thank you for having me today to discuss the perils of Section 702 and how we can reform the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to better serve people across the country. Privacy is one of our most important foundational rights, and the United States Constitution protects us all from unlawful searches by the government. But for years, the FBI and other agencies have used provisions of FISA and other authorities to conduct backdoor searches about Americans at an alarming scale. This has included phone calls, text messages, emails, and other electronic communications between U.S. persons and people living in other countries. Law enforcement can then use this information for prosecution of a crime that has nothing to do with national security, even when it was collected without a warrant. And we've seen immigrants and members of the AANHPI community be unfairly targeted and racially profiled. Those who talk regularly with people who live abroad, colleagues, friends, family, can be picked out for surveillance in ways that go against our country's guaranteed freedoms. And on top of that, we Asian Americans are still too often viewed as perpetual foreigners. Even though many of us have lived in the United States for generations, too many question our loyalty to this country. We saw that with the Trump administration's China initiative that unjustly targeted scientists and academics of Asian descent for investigation and prosecution. And just earlier this year, we learned that the FBI had been breaking their own rules and unlawfully digging through millions of communications using Section 702 as a cover for this activity. It is totally unacceptable and we cannot allow the privacy rights of Americans to continue to be violated. All of this is why any FISA reauthorization must overhaul privacy protections. A clean reauthorization of Section 702 is a non-starter. We need real reforms that will guarantee the right to privacy for people across the country and make sure that government agencies can't keep overreaching into our personal communications without going through the proper legal processes. As FISA expires at the end of 2023, we must take this opportunity to reform surveillance authorities and overhaul privacy protections for Americans so that they truly protect the civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy rights that are foundational to our democracy. I will keep pushing for these important reforms in Congress to shield all Americans, including AANHPI communities, from unlawful surveillance. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for this very powerful and inspirational speech and for your commitment to do everything you can to push for real Section 702 reforms. 
when it expires on December 31, 2023. I would like to affirm what Congresswoman Jaya Paul just said about how dangerous it is for our government to conduct searches without warrants. Prior to my retirement, I presided in the criminal and civil courts of our San Francisco Superior Court. And I have reviewed and issued thousands of warrants. But before I issue a warrant, I always make sure that the officer requesting for the warrant swears under penalty of perjury that the affidavit is true and there's probable cause for the warrant. Probable cause means that there is a reasonable basis to believe that a crime may have been committed and the person most likely committed a crime. Or there's a reasonable basis to believe the evidence of the crime most likely is present in the place to be searched. Like all judges, I took that responsibility very seriously. And at times I have declined an officer's request for the warrant, or other times I've asked the officer to give me more facts before I was signed the warrant. In my 30 plus years as a judge, I truly believe that it is very important to have an independent judge's review for the issuance of a warrant to protect an individual's privacy and absent exigent circumstances. All searches of Americans in the United States should be conducted with a warrant. Unfortunately, this is not the case. And um, we will hear from our esteemed panelists how Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Security Act has permitted warrantless searches of Americans in the United States. As the title suggested, the law was originally created to provide oversight of the government's surveillance of foreign entities and persons located outside of the United States. It was claimed to be a vital tool to combat terrorism, especially after 9-11 terrorist attack in 2001. However, as we all know, Edward Snowden's leak showed the United States government was conducting mass surveillances on Americans in the United States. According to Cato Institute's online policy forum on June 6th of this year, the FBI has used 702 of FASA, FISA, excuse me, to gather database queries on millions of United States persons who are not even necessarily wanted for a crime. So what happened? How come Section 702 is being used against Americans in the United States, and especially disproportionately used against Chinese Americans in the United States? When, I'll remind everyone, no person of Chinese origin was known to be part of the 9-11 or other terrorist attacks. You will hear from our esteemed panelists that through a system called reverse targeting and backdoor searches, the government can target Americans in the United States simply because that person is communicating with a suspected person located aboard. A suspected person is usually considered a person from an enemy country, which in today's politics and parlance is a shorthand term for anyone from China. Since the Department of Justice and the FBI have declared the economic espionage is a major security threat to the United States and China is the United States' number one enemy. Hence, Chinese Americans are viewed like slaves to be suspects and potential spies for China. This is extremely dangerous and is reminiscent of the Cold War and the McCarthy era of the 1950s. Like the McCarthy era, Today, Chinese Americans, especially those in the scientific and academic communities, have been targeted for warrantless surveillance that, that led to wrongful and unjust prosecutions. You will hear today from two of our panelists that they may have been targets of Section 702 surveillances. You will also hear from our esteemed panelists 
what Section 702 is and what we need to do when it expires on December 31, 2023, and whether we should reauthorize this law, and if so, what significant reforms are needed. Again, these extremely challenging and difficult tasks to tackle, and we only have 70 minutes, so it's not gonna be easy. The format of this panel is that each of our panelists will speak for about 50 minutes. They will take up approximately 35 minutes, leaving us another 35 minutes for questions and answers. So let's now hear from our esteemed panelists. First of our distinguished panelists will be Elizabeth Gratin. Elizabeth is a senior director of the Brandon Center for Justice, Liberty and National Security Program. She is a nationally recognized expert on government surveillance and government secrecy, which is exactly what Section 702 of FISA is about. Liza was also counsel to Senator Russ Feingold, chairperson of the Constitution Subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee when Congress first enacted Section 702 of FISA. This makes Liza, among other reasons, an eminently qualified speaker on this subject. Let's now hear from Liza. Liza, would you please take it over? Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for being here for this very important event. I'm going to start by giving you a background about Section 702 and, and why and how it's become so problematic. Section 702 of FISA was enacted after 9-11 to make it easier for the government to conduct surveillance of suspected foreign terrorists. Uh, the law allows the government to target almost any foreigner abroad and to collect all of their communications without any individualized court order. The only substantive restriction is that a significant purpose of the surveillance has to be acquiring foreign intelligence, which is defined very broadly in the law to include, among other things, any information that relates to the conduct of US foreign affairs. So a conversation between friends about US trade policy with China would justify surveillance under that definition. A special court known as the FISA court conducts general oversight of the surveillance, but it has no role in approving individual targets. Uh, although the original purpose of Section 702 was to serve as a counterterrorism tool, uh, its uses have evolved significantly since the law was passed. And most recently, we've heard government officials saying that the law is used uh, primarily to combat espionage, cyber attacks, and fentanyl trafficking. And of course, the culprit that government officials most often identify in connection with these activities is China. Although Section 702 has to be targeted at foreigners abroad, it inevitably sweeps in large volumes of Americans' communications because Americans communicate with foreigners. The government refers to this collection of Americans' communications as incidental because the Americans are not the intended targets of the surveillance. And in fact, if the government's intent were to eavesdrop on these Americans, it would have to get either a warrant in a criminal investigation or something called a FISA Title I order in a foreign intelligence investigation. That's basically a type of warrant where the government shows probable cause that the target is an agent of a foreign power. To prevent the government from using Section 702 to get around these requirements, Congress did two things. First, it required the government to minimize the collection, retention, and sharing of Americans' information. And second, it required the government to certify to the FISA court on an annual basis that it's not using Section 702 to try to access Americans' communications. That's called reverse targeting, and it's prohibited under the law. Over the past 15 years, it's become abundantly clear that these protections have failed. In particular, all of the agencies that receive Section 702 data, that includes the NSA, the CIA, the National Counterterrorism Center, and the FBI, have adopted procedures that allow them to go rummaging through the data they have obtained under Section 702, specifically looking 
for Americans communications. So having obtained all of this data without a warrant by certifying that they are not targeting Americans, as soon as they have the data in their hands, all of the agencies uh, routinely search the data for Americans communications. This is a bait and switch that drives an enormous hole through the Fourth Amendment. The FBI conducted around 200,000 of these warrantless searches in 2022 alone. Congress and the FISA court have taken some steps to try to rein in these backdoor searches a little bit, uh, but the FBI has routinely ignored the limit Congress that they have imposed. So for example, in 2018, Congress enacted a requirement that the FBI has to get a warrant for a very small subset of these searches. Um, that requirement has been triggered approximately 100 times since Congress passed that provision. But according to the government's own reports, the FBI has never once complied with it. Outside of this narrow category of searches, the FISA court has approved a rule that queries of, uh, for Americans' communications have to be reasonably likely to yield foreign intelligence or evidence of a crime. That's not a very high bar. Nonetheless, recent FISA court opinions have found that the FBI has engaged in, quote, widespread violations of this standard. Those violations include searches aimed at 113 Black Lives Matter protesters, multiple U.S. government officials, journalists, and political commentators, 19,000 contributors to a single congressional campaign, and two, quote, Middle Eastern men whose offense was that they were witnessed loading cleaning supplies into a vehicle. Given this history, a coalition of organizations, including the Brennan Center, is urging Congress not to reauthorize Section 702 without sweeping reforms. And I'll mention just two of those here. First, Congress should require government agencies to obtain either a warrant or a FISA Title I order before conducting searches of Section 702 data for Americans' communications. And second, Congress should narrow the permissible pool of foreign targets so that it doesn't include pretty much any foreigner abroad, but rather is limited to those foreigners abroad who are reasonably likely to have some information about threats to the United States. And that would protect not only innocent foreign citizens of other nations, but also the American friends, colleagues, and relatives with whom they communicate. So I'll stop there, but I look forward to, to this discussion and, and hearing some questions from all of you. Liza, you are terrific. You did it all within almost five minutes. Thank you all so right. much. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Gan Chen, who is a Soderbergh Professor of Power Engineering at MIT. He's an expert in heat transfer at the nanoscale and develops solutions to humanity's challenges in energy and water. Boy, do we need his commitment and talent in such an area. He served as the head of the MIT Department on Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Chen is not only a world-renowned scientist, but also a victim of the DOJ's China Initiative. When on January 4th, 2021, he was arrested at his home and charged with fraud for allegedly failing to disclose ties to China and wire fraud and with receiving millions in grant funds. As soon as Dr. Chen was charged and arrested, 200 MIT faculty members wrote a compelling, quote, we are all Gan Chen, unquote, letter to MIT President Reed, sharing similar concerns about the China initiative. MIT stepped up to support Dr. Chen and even paid for his legal fees, which prompted Dr. Chen to say, I am the luckiest among the unlucky ones. All these charges were dropped on January 20th, 2022. And not after Dr. Chen and his family has suffered from unspeakable harm, psychological and emotional suffering, mental anguish, and pain. 
We're so fortunate that Dr. Chen is willing to join us in this webinar and share with us his thoughts. Dr. Chen, thank you for coming. Thank you, Nina, for your kind introduction. Um, let me add a few more detail of my audio and connect to uh, the topic to do today, Pfizer 702. So my audio started in January 2020 when I returned from an international trip to uh, China, Egypt, and Morocco. At the Logan Airport, I was detained for three hours and interrogated, and all my electronics were confiscated. After that incident, MIT offered me to hire a lawyer and introduced me to excellent lawyer, Mr. Ralph Fisher and his team. MIT also hired its own external lawyer and both of them conducted their investigation and I found I did nothing wrong. Almost a year in December, 2020, the lead prosecutor of the government on my case, uh, Ms. Stephanie Sigmund, who was the chief of national security unit working under the U.S. attorney Andrew Lerling in Massachusetts district, told both lawyers that there were no eminent indictment, not in the next six months. However, within months, in the early morning of January 14, 2021, between 10 to 20 federal agents stormed into my home. They woke up my wife and my daughter from their sleep, handcuffed me, and put me in prison. Mr. Andrew Lennon rushed my indictment to have an eye-catching news conference before his term expired with Donald Trump's presidency. In a news conference that day, Andrew Lennon and the FBI special agent in charge, Mr. Joseph Bonavolonta, made statements that were just false. Andrew Lennon questioned my loyalty to U.S., and Mr. Bonavolonta described as if I took $29 million foreign funding to my own pocket, where they well knew that was MIT's official contract. In fact, in my home the same day, my wife asked agents, what was my crime? One answered, he took $19 million. My wife said, where is the $19 million in my home? And the agent answered at MIT. This shows that they knew clearly it was an MIT contract, not me taking the money. Yet uh, the prosecution went down for over slightly over a year. In January 20, 2022, the DOJ dropped all its charges against me. As Linian said, my family suffered. My career was ruined. And I'm not kissed among the unlucky ones because the MIT leadership, and MIT faculty stood strongly behind me and the entire scientific community stood behind me. The whole investigation and prosecution were full of misconducts by the FBI and the prosecutors from the start to finish. I summarized their misconducts into seven patterns. One, they knowingly altered the facts, Two, they criminalized routine professional activities. Three, they used emails I did not reply as criminal evidence. Four, when I followed the law and did write them, they said I was hiding something. Five, they rushed the case. They did not do their job. Six, they hide the truth. And seven, they never admit the mistakes. I have talked about this extensively in the past, which you can find from YouTube easily. I will not repeat them here today. I have asked my lawyer, Rob, Mr. Rob Fisher and his team, why I became a target. Well, there are different speculations. Rob said the most likely one was that I had a few communications with the Chinese embassy. Well, the embassy staff came to MIT. I met them a few times, either on MIT business or just informally or casual and greetings. I made sure no confidential information was ever shared. I'm a very careful person. I had a few email communications with them and reached out to them for help with visa to China. These were all the communication I ever had with them. 
In a motion, my lawyers filed on my behalf on if there are discoverable materials in government's SIPA, SIPA production. We questioned the possibility of FBI collect data on the FISA Title I and the FISA 702. The government complaints and search affidavits showed some of my WeChat and email communication were the Chinese colleagues uh, were, say, uh, searched. And these were all normal communication, but the government had distorted this communication as the evidence. Let me just give one example. In October 2017, a colleague in China wrote to me, Dear Gang, this year is a lucky year for me. I have been awarded with two big grants, which I need good people to help. At the same time, Institute of X at Y University, I omit the name, has been formally funded in the past April. We do need to hire more than 30 faculty in mechanical, energy, advanced material, electronics, and biomedical. Could you help recommend some good guys? If the recommendation, recommended one gets a young Southern talent title, you can get a 15% the first year salary of his or her as a ward in cash. Your kind help is highly appreciated, best regard. To me, this was clearly inappropriate. So my only answer was, uh, they, congratulations, gone. That's all I wrote. But yet, this is what government wrote. On or about October 1st, 2017, Chen was offered a position at the Y University. Based upon the documents I have reviewed, this university is funded by China's Minister of Science and Technology and the National Science Foundation of China. I intend to hire more than 30 faculty in mechanical, energy, advanced material, electronics, and biomedical science. They request Chen to assist the PRC in funding and recommending scientists to their program. Chen was offered 15% of the first year salary of a student who received a Southern Talent title and the position at Y University as a ward. As of this day, I'm uncertain as to whether Chen accepted this position. I just give this one example. I have numerous others. You can infer many points, several points from this thing. Even say this communication, right, distorted, right? They, they, the problem is they distorted the co communication and used to charge against the innocent citizen. I'm not really sure whether this is done through five or seven two, but it certainly shows the danger of warrantless surveillance. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. You've gone through so much. <laughs> One question I want to ask you that I won't ask is, what, are you angry with our government? I would. Uh, it's just so much you have gone through, so much pain and suffering, and I don't know whether or not your family will ever be the same. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ashley Gorski, who is a senior staff attorney in the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU's National Security Project, where she litigates and works on policy issues related to government surveillance, national security, prosecution, and racial and religious discrimination. The ACLU, as you know, has been in the forefront of helping Chinese Americans who have been targeted under the China initiatives, as well as those who were targeted before the launch of the China initiative, such as Professor Xiaoxing Xi. Professor Xi is a world-renowned expert in the field of superconductivity, but in May of 2015, the FBI agents swarmed Professor Xi's Philadelphia home, just like they did with Professor Chen, rounded up his family at gunpoint and arrested him, falsely accusing him of sharing sensitive technology with scientists in China. Less than four months later, the government dropped all charges against Professor Xi without any explanation, and of course, without any apologies. Before Professor Xi's arrest, the government secretly used some of its most powerful surveillance tools against him, including 
as his lawsuit explains, Section 702 of FISA. In 2017, ACLU helped Professor Xi and his family bring a suit against the government. The district court dismissed nearly all of his claims in 2021. But just last month, a federal appeals court ruled in favor of Professor Xi, allowing Professor Xi and his family to move forward with the case against the United States government. Ashley is in the forefront of ACLU's work challenging overbroad government surveillance and discrimination against Chinese Americans. Ashley, can you talk to us about that? Yes, and thank you so much, Lillian, and thank you to APA Justice for having me join today. Uh, my remarks are going to focus primarily on the obstacles to accountability in the courts for Section 702 surveillance. And these obstacles are a major problem in two respects. Um, first, there are problems for the people whose privacy is violated by the surveillance. And these privacy violations have real world consequences, including for people who are subject to further government scrutiny and unjustified investigations as a result. Oh, excuse me. These people should be able to obtain relief in our courts. But to date, that relief has been unavailable for Section 702 surveillance for reasons I'll explain. Second, these obstacles pose a problem at a broader structural level, because in a democracy like ours, the government is supposed to be accountable for its actions. There are supposed to be checks and balances, including judicial oversight of surveillance, where it's subject to adversarial two-sided testing, not just one-sided proceedings in the secret foreign intelligence surveillance court. However, um, because of legal hurdles and because of the aggressive positions that the Department of Justice has taken in court, there have been very few opportunities to litigate Section 702 surveillance in the ordinary public courts. And we and other lawyers in those cases have been hobbled by the government's overbroad claims of secrecy. So diving right in, there are two basic categories of cases where Section 702 surveillance can be challenged, civil cases and criminal cases. And I'll start with explaining the problems in the civil context, where people who are affected by this surveillance bring their own suit against the government. And here there are three interlocking obstacles to obtaining redress. The first is notice. When people are subject to the surveillance, they do not receive notice of that fact. The surveillance is secret. There is a very narrow exception for when the government wants to use information from 702 surveillance in a criminal prosecution, which I'll come back to. But for nearly everyone whose communications are swept up by section 702, they won't receive notice. And so they often won't know that they've been subject to the surveillance. Second, when people have reason to believe that they've been surveilled, for example, due to news articles, they have to show what's called standing to challenge that surveillance in court. That means they have to prove that they're subject to the government conduct they're challenging. And when you are talking about a secret surveillance program, that is very hard to do. And that brings us to the third obstacle, which is really the biggest one, something called the state secrets privilege, which allows the government to withhold evidence from a plaintiff and from the court where the government says the disclosure would harm national security. The government routinely invokes this privilege to block plaintiffs from accessing evidence in surveillance cases, even under you know, hypothetical special security measures and extreme secrecy. The government just says you don't get any access at all and neither does the court. And then increasingly, the executive branch has been using this privilege even more aggressively to argue that entire lawsuits should simply be dismissed on secrecy grounds, which is really a dramatic expansion and distortion of what the privilege is supposed to be. And as one example, uh, my colleagues at the ACLU and I represented the Wikimedia Foundation, which operates the website Wikipedia, in a challenge to a kind of surveillance under Section 702. And this litigation lasted for eight years, but the courts never reached the merits of our case. And the case was essentially dismissed on state secrets grounds. So unfortunately, due to this combination of policy and doctrinal hurdles, no civil lawsuit challenging 702 surveillance has resulted in a court opinion addressing the legality of that surveillance. On the criminal side, there are also significant obstacles. 
Here, the government does have the obligation to notify defendants when it intends to use information from 702 surveillance against them. The problem is that the government has a track record of interpreting this obligation extremely narrowly. In the last several years, no defendants have received notice, which doesn't make sense uh, given the scale of the government's surveillance under Section 702 and the scale of its backdoor searches. We know from other contexts that the government has routinely engaged in a practice known as parallel construction, where it hides the fact that it originally obtained evidence from a controversial surveillance tool by reobtaining that same evidence through a different, less controversial tool. And we suspect that this is a factor in the lack of 702 notices in criminal cases. And in these cases more generally, secrecy is a huge problem. Even when defendants have counsel with security clearances, the government argues that defense counsel shouldn't get access to information about the surveillance, which makes it very difficult to bring a meaningful, informed challenge to the surveillance. So what is the solution? The solution is clearly legislative reform. There are simple, straightforward legislative reforms to address each of these problems. In civil cases, to limit the government's ability to use the state secrets privilege and to allow courts to review secret evidence behind closed doors. And in criminal cases, to clarify the government's notice obligations so that it can't hide behind parallel construction and to ensure that defense counsel with security clearances can access the information they need. Thank you. Wow, that is amazing, actually, the information that you've just given us. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you afterwards. Let's now go to our last speaker, Brian Sun, who is a partner of Northern Rose Fulbright and a board member of the Committee of 100. Brian is a seasoned trial lawyer and former assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California. Brian is also a co-founder and board member of the Alliance for Asian American Justice, an organization devoting pro bono legal resources to the support and representation of victims of anti-Asian hate crimes and harassment. Brian also represented Dr. Wen Ho Lee in his successful civil lawsuit against the U.S. government for leaking Dr. Lee's name to journalists before charges have been filed against him. But what makes Brian a unique speaker today is not only because He's such a qualified lawyer, but because he himself is also a victim of Section 702 searches. He was picked up on two Pfizer wiretaps and cases he has handled, even though he has received high-level security clearances prior to those interceptions. How can that happen? What happened to the attorney-client privilege which is one of the most sacred privileges in law. Let's now hear from Brian. Brian? <clears throat> thank you, Lillian, and thanks for the invitation to speak to everyone today. Um, in the short time we have, I always like to talk about history, history repeating itself in the sense that, um, you know, the Fourth Amendment says um, the government shall be prohibited from not engaging in unreasonable searches and seizures of citizenry. So what's to define unreasonable? And that segues into the notion of, that I often talk about, which is the national security uh, justification, if you will, for warrantless surveillance um, and, and versus due process. And forgive my tongue in cheek pun, but I often say that in this country, national security trumps due process. And I mean Trump. <laughs> and <laughs> in, in that sense, in that sense, um, history has shown that whether it's national security concerns about the loyalty of Japanese Americans during World War II and hence their, um, in my view, unconstitutional internment to today as we deal with. Um, but as interestingly, um, the greater threat of intrusion as technology has evolved. Back in my day when I was a federal prosecutor, if you wanted to go conduct a wiretap and it wasn't related to national security, the amount of hoops that you had to jump through in order to get a court to authorize a telephone interception of a subject or a target was substantial. 
and minimization was part of it, meaning, you know, you're not supposed to listen in on stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the suspected crime activity, and you're supposed to minimize. And in the instances of where I told Lillian that I had been picked up on a couple of fire wires, FISA wiretaps, that, and I like to say that I know of, there's probably a whole slew that I don't know of. Um, one was involving an export control investigation, that is to say the export of night vision goggle technology to China by a Chinese American who was exporting you know, old equipment. In other words, the state of the art stuff you could buy in France commercially and just import it and export it to China. But the American government was ex investigating my guy and intercepted our attorney-client privilege communications, which I only found out later after he was charged. Another one was the um, case involving an FBI agent who was um, under investigation for giving secrets to China through his alleged paramour and asset, a Chinese American businesswoman. And what's interesting about that anecdote quickly is that I'm on the phone with my client, the FBI agent, and I'm saying, if anybody is listening to this call, this is an attorney-client privilege conversation, and you should minimize, literally, those words. Well, sure enough, after they charge my guy, we find out in the classified materials turned over to us, much like in Gong's case, um, that my telephone conversation with the client had been intercepted and used by the government against him and his alleged paramour, uh, the Chinese American businesswoman. And I can tell you the judge did not like it. And it cost the government significantly when she found out about it. Which now segues to my other point, which is how do we how do we build reforms and how do we build a counter, whether it's the FISA court or the standards and procedures by which we um, um, can build in to try to get some accountability and what have you into the process. And that is gonna be tricky because again, national security trumps due process. And in the US-China context, which is what brings us here today, we're all suspect. And from the loyalty standpoint, um, to the extent you have ties and relationships with uh, Chinese nationals or Chinese government or educational or academics, because everybody in China is viewed as an extension of the government, state-owned, universe, uh, run universities or state-controlled assets and things like that. So we have we have a bit of, of work to do here because the technology is it's scary. If you ever, ever watch these, uh, what do they call them, Jason Bourne movies, where they're got the screens up there and they're listening in to everybody and anything, and they're doing all the AI stuff that you think um, is just TV. No, you can do that stuff. And and it is a little scary about what they they um, the government can listen in and, and surveil without your knowledge. And again, um, when you're going after conditional crime suspects and investigating, I certainly think there's got to be greater and stronger restraints on government surveillance when you know you're chasing a target. If you're intelligence gathering, which is what the national security um, people would say is a very important part of this process to defend America, to detect and prevent the next 911. How do you strike that balance? And therein lies the challenges we have with the evolving technology and folks who would probably take the view that national security is much more important than whether or not Brian's son knows that his conversation with his client was eavesdropped on by some agent. So these are the tensions that we have in these cases. Um, what bothers me, of course, is the profiling aspects and the, the singling out of Chinese Americans for a perceived lack of loyalty, which is the same kind of stuff that we experienced in the 1950s during the McCarthy era, still continues to this day, 70 plus years later. And unless we speak up and talk about it, make some noise, join in, with the ACLU and other organizations. And it doesn't just uh, civil rights organizations that have these concerns. It, <laughs> when an interesting convergence here is the right and the left and the center and all these political philosophies, I think we all share in this notion, circling back to my original comment, that the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution says 
unreasonable search and seizures. And the qu big question is, what is reasonable in this context? And that debate, which is one we can continue on for all day long today, which we don't have time for, but I would tell you is what we need to be sensitive and cognizant of. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Brian, for su such a wonderful presentation. We are now finished with our formal presentations and we move to the question and answer phase of our webinar. Um, first of all, we have some prepared questions and then we'll go to the questions from our audience. One question that I'd like to ask, actually, Ashley, is the legislative proposals. You mentioned legislative reforms to fix the obstacles to redress for people subject to Section 702 surveillance. I want to ask you, what is the government's position on these legislative reforms that you had mentioned? Thanks, Lillian. Um, so we know that the Biden administration has taken the position that it wants a quote unquote clean reauthorization of Section 702. It wants this law to be reauthorized without any reforms at all. But what is clear is that there is now a bipartisan consensus in Congress uh, for the fact that serious reforms, significant, meaningful reforms are going to be necessary and that a clean reauthorization is not realistic. So we don't have the executive branch's um, specific takes on our particular ideas, proposals for reforms to fix these obstacles to redress. But we do know that as a general matter, the executive branch takes the position that 702 is just fine as it is and that you know, there's enough judicial review from their perspective. Well, let me just go to Liza then. Many organizations, including the Brennan Center, have argued that a government should be required to get a warrant before searching Section 702 data for Americans' communications. What are the government's arguments for why it should not have to get a warrant? And how would you respond to those arguments? Sure. So the government has actually been a little more forthcoming when responding on this, this particular issue. They, they've essentially been forced to take a position on the question of whether there should be warrants for, for these backdoor searches. Um, and the government's main argument is that uh, a warrant requirement for these searches would be unworkable. And it would be unworkable because the government is conducting 200,000 of these searches every year, uh, and the courts uh, can't absorb an additional 200,000 warrant applications. Uh, and even if they could, the government wouldn't be able to show probable cause in a lot of these cases. So that's the government's argument. Of course, the fact that the government is conducting such an enormous number of warrantless searches and the fact that the government doesn't have probable causes in many, if not most of these cases, is exactly why advocates like the Brennan Center are pushing for a warrant requirement. Yes, it will constrain surveillance. That is the point. That's the, that is a feature of warrants. It's not a bug. Um, another argument that we've heard from the government is that they need to be able to perform warrantless searches of Americans' communications in order to identify potential American victims of foreign uh, espionage recruitment efforts or foreign influence campaigns and things like that. Um, it's not really clear and the government hasn't made it clear how that works exactly as a practical matter. Uh, but what is clear is that protecting victims is not unique to the Section 702 context. Domestic law enforcement agencies uh, are faced with this task routinely and they manage to keep the American public safe using investigative techniques that comport with the Fourth Amendment, including where necessary, uh, obtaining the consent and the cooperation of potential victims. And also there's an exigency uh, exception to the warrant requirement where lives are in immediate danger, that sort of thing. But there is no blanket victim exception to the Fourth Amendment. And there's a good reason for that, particularly when we're talking about things like foreign influence campaigns, the line between suspect and victim can be quite malleable. Uh, and what we saw 
throughout the early decades of the Cold War, the FBI was uh, surveilling anti-war protesters and civil rights activists based on the justification that there were foreign communist groups that were attempting to influence or infiltrate these groups. Uh, and then after 9-11, American Muslims were subject to surveillance based on the justification that foreign uh, terrorist organizations were attempting to influence them. Uh, most recently, Eva, we've seen claims of potential foreign influence with, with Black Lives Matter activists. So history tells us this is a very dangerous uh, distinction to make, a very dangerous door to open. Thank you, Liza. Um, you know, with all these surveillances targeted against Chinese American scientists, we see that top Chinese scientists are giving up the US citizenships and returning to China, such as the recent She Xiaoliang is the latest Chinese scientist to give up his US citizenship. For those of you who don't know who he is, he's a former Harvard professor, is part of a, and a very, very important person. I'm gonna ask Gan whether you're surprised that so many Chinese American scientists from well-known universities are leaving the United States at this time. Um, no, I'm not surprised uh, given uh, what people have seen, what I went through and uh, many other people went through. And in fact, uh, many of these cases uh, were not reported. And uh, a few months ago, Science had a, a big article about the National Institute of Health uh, under Mike Lauer, the prosecution of uh, uh, Chinese scientists. And uh, they, uh, uh, when people live in fear, and when they cannot do the research, when can, they cannot secure research funding, they will find another places. So we have seen uh, scientists of Chinese origin, many of them Chinese American, live in the country and going either to China, but many of them went to some other countries. They just want to have a life. They can do research. So this is a really harming fundamentally US, its own national security. Well, it sounds like US, our country is losing out and losing a lot of very talented people to other countries. Brian. Do you think your ethnicity has something to do with what happened to you when you were picked up on the visa wiretaps? Do you think equal treatment will be given to a non-Chinese American lawyer talking to his client about some export to China? Probably not. Probably not in the case I had. I just, um, both cases were ones that um, I think there was also some non-Asian lawyers that were picked up on the FISA wiretaps or eavesdropping. So I don't think my ethnicity mattered. Um, whether or not I could be more suspect than someone else who knows, um, being a former federal prosecutor, I had clearances during the Wen Ho Lee case. I got a Q clearance, which is a pretty high clearance um, for the Los Alamos lab, and uh, which you know they did all background checking. But, you know, it, 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 the government will tell you that the eavesdropping, they go where they think the threat is or in the criminal realm where they think the crime is and they don't care who they target. And I, I do believe that's the case. Um, what you have to deal with, and you can call them true believers, just like we truly believe in the Fourth Amendment and, and the limits set forth in the Constitution. There is a balancing to be struck here because the people who are engaging in the surveillance at the NSA, DIA, CIA, every other alphabet organization you can think of, they truly believe they're trying to protect this country and the people in it from foreign threats, okay? And, and the sincerity is, you know, I've talked to them millions of times, they, they, they're they sincere. And, but you again have to strike the balance against the excesses, the overzealous, and some who would place this, this perception of a national security threat on a level that goes to the earlier point you just asked um, um, folks about, which is we're loyal Chinese Americans, you know, just like anybody else. They picked me up 
whether I was Chinese or not Chinese, and talking to my Caucasian client, in the case of the FBI agent, okay, he was a Caucasian FBI agent, um, you know, they don't, in, in that sense, it's maybe colorblind, but in another sense, the US-China politic is creating the kind of damage that you just alluded to. The most well-known example is um, Professor Shui Chen from Caltech in the 50s, who um, oh, yeah. was a leading, leading scientist mm. and who was hounded by the FBI, went back to China and helped China develop the H-bomb. That's okay. right. All right, so, so you have, you've got, there's gotta be a better understanding by the folks conducting this surveillance and and maybe greater sensitivity, but we have to try to put in some checks. Otherwise it will go unchecked. And as I said, with the technology being what it is now, not that I'm a paranoid sort, but somebody's probably watching this webinar too. And <laughs> everybody's names is on a list. Gong and I and Ashley Liza are already on the list. So all you attend probably I'm on the list too. Uh, yes, Lillian, join the crowd. But you know, it's, it's Stephen and others, Jeremy, we're all there. But you know, that's okay. You know, Brian, we're like you said, stand up and speak about it. Okay. Can, like can you I... said, when you what like you yeah. said when you first started your presentation, we don't learn from history. In the 50s, that was already this problem. We're now talking about 2023. Liza, would you like to add yeah, something to what I, Brian just said? I wanted to jump in. I think Brian's being a little too kind because uh, FBI agents, NSA agents, CIA agents, all of them, they are human beings and human beings have prejudices. One of the things that is most important about the warrant requirement about the Fourth Amendment. It is not just a protection for civil liberties. It is a protection for civil rights. And that's because uh, when agents, uh, government officials don't have to show evidence of actual, you know, fact-based evidence of criminal wrongdoing or other types of wrongdoing, it is so much easier for them to fall back on prejudices, whether conscious or subconscious prejudices. And that can be ethnicity, it can be nationality. And so a warrant requirement helps to protect against these types of prejudices, which people have, from infecting the work in, in the way that, that is going to end up singling out people who should not be singled out based on these constitutionally protected characteristics. So that is one of the main reasons why I think we need a warrant requirement is to protect uh, against this kind of prejudice. I agree with you, Liza. I think a warrant is really necessary for any searches of Americans in the United States. But you know what? Even judges of the most learned category, when you talk about national security, you get scared. They don't know what that means. And unless they are sensitive to what we are talking about, as soon as you say national security, they will do exactly what Gans case quash uh, uh, disclosure of any evidence, Brian's cases, and deny a lot of these requests for warrant searches. But anyway, we have uh, we better open up our uh, webinar to our audience. First of all, let me tell the audience: please use the Zoom question and answer feature to post questions to the panelists. We have several questions that were already submitted, and one of them. Uh, that was submitted was under uh, FARA violations. It says there's been a number of persons charged with FARA violations in recent years. Was warrantless surveillance used in these cases? Is there a possibility of selective prosecution based on race since most such violations have been handled civilly? All right, who would like to answer that question? Brian? Well, I, I think I understood that as a compound question, but it is a compound. It's complex and compound. Yeah, <laughs> let's just do it with the first but, part of it, the FARA issue violation. Yeah, which has had to do with registration. Yeah, I, I, I can tackle that. FARA has a, an interesting history since it started getting used more in the investigations of people with connections with Russian ties, but it is now clearly morphed into the China Initiative and to the modern. Uh, national security um, criminal part of the process, um, you know, and it's uh, it's it's another form of what I almost consider a gotcha type of violation, 
you haven't registered with the foreign government that you're acting for the benefit or behest of a foreign government. But some of the cases here have become very, very technical, like a, an employee of a Chinese-owned, state-owned asset, like an airline or something like that, doing something, a service for a Chinese government official, say at a consulate or an embassy, that can be a FARA violation. So it can be very technical, not really involve national security threats, but is used as a way to go charge somebody if they're looking to charge somebody with something off the intelligence they get from the surveillance. Again, there's the intelligence gathering function and then the and the and the criminal prosecution stuff. Now I want to just say in, uh, in to augment Liza's earlier comment, you know, the national security folks would say, okay, warrants is too, doing that is too cumbersome, too, too much person power to, to, to possibly do it all. And why not trust, and I put that in quotes, um, agents, prosecutors, like I used to be when I issued grand jury subpoenas with non-disclosure notices, pen register apps, all those things without having to check with a court. Um, you know, uh, though pen registers, I did have to get court permission, but it was very technical, formulaic. You just sign your name to a form, stick in somebody's name and phone number, and you stick it in. Why not do that as a way to, to streamline the process? But trust, this is the words I put, put in quotes, trust the people to do the right thing. There's a tension there because we've seen all sorts of abuse from this trust that's been uh, given to these intelligence officials who under the rubric of gathering intelligence are in fact maybe running amok sometimes. So it's, it's I don't have an answer. I'm just saying you, that's the state of the, the debate right now and what we can do to try to strike a balance. Thank you, Brian. Uh, going back to Farah, I think there is a Chinese American community activist and hotel worker by the name of Li Tan, Henry Leung, who's being charged on, on the FARA and the Chinese American communities around the country are lobbying around him because again, he may be targeted because he's Chinese Americans who's exercising his First Amendment right and his communication with the uh, consulate's office. So under FARA, he's been charged. Um, our first question submitted by the audience participant today is, how does 702 intersect with the Patriot Act. Ashley? So these are two um, distinct laws. The Patriot Act rushed into law shortly after 9-11 without meaningful congressional debate, did loosen a lot of the standards for conducting foreign intelligence surveillance and made it easier for the government to conduct a number of different kinds of foreign intelligence surveillance. But Section 702 is a completely separate authority um, after 9-11, the Bush administration engaged in widespread warrantless wiretapping, including of Americans' international communications. And it did that without any court oversight whatsoever, in clear violation of both the Fourth Amendment and the statutory law at the time. Uh, eventually, the Bush administration tried to get the secret foreign intelligence surveillance court to supervise some of that. And when the foreign intelligence surveillance court refused to approve this kind of international surveillance of international communications, the administration went to Congress and lobbied for a new law. And that new law was Section 702. Precursor was passed in 2007. Section 702 was first passed in, in 2008. So that is separate and apart from the Patriot Act, although the Patriot Act has a lot of symbolic force as a law that uh, really gave the executive branch significant power uh, to conduct surveillance for national security purposes. Thank you. We have another question. Can you see any parallels between FBI versus Fazaga and the targeting of communities based on national identity under the guise of national security state secrets? That's I'm, a different, I'm to, Liza, I'm, please. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, I think what FBI versus Fazaga is all about is the targeting of community case, uh, tar targeting of communities uh, in that case based on religion, sort of probably a combination of religion and, and ethnicity. But that was a, 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 that case involved 
uh, the use of informants by the FBI in Southern California to uh, infiltrate mosques and uh, to try to uh, essentially go on fishing expeditions to try to find anybody who might be involved in terrorist activity. There was absolutely no basis for suspicion at the time that the informants went into these places of worship. And in fact, the informants were uh, instructed to try to essentially provoke people uh, into having conversations about jihad and, and, and terrorist activity and that sort of thing. Um, so this was done entirely based on not suspicion of wrongdoing, but rather the, the, the religion of this of these communities in Southern California. Um, and a lawsuit was brought um, challenging this. And uh, sure enough, uh, the government invoked the state secrets privilege um, and uh, the Supreme Court recently held that the state secrets privilege uh, allowed the government to essentially um, dismiss, allowed the court to dismiss a whole set of claims in this lawsuit. And that gets to what Ashley was talking about, about these sort of uh, artificial barriers to judicial review of unlawful surveillance. Um, but that's exactly that what was happening uh, in that case. And so we, absolutely, you can see parallels to uh, the use of Section 702 uh, in some disturbing ways that I was talking about earlier that invoke some of these uh, issues of discriminatory surveillance based on ideology or based on ethnicity in some cases. Thank you. Um, Brian, you mentioned that some of us may all be under uh, Section 702 surveillance. There's a question here. What are the possible evidence that someone may be under secret government surveillance? And if so, what can be done by the individual? There's no uh, notice, so what can be done? You know, I've gotten more than a few calls and maybe Liza and Ashley as well from folks who think they're under some type of surveillance or investigation or activity. Um, you know, we as lawyers, like to um, think that we're not, and that um, it's really only in the exceptional cases the government will do it. But each case is different. Um, I don't want to say that somebody is absolutely paranoid and saying that they're not, uh, or trying to tell them, don't worry about it, you're probably not. Uh, because, you know, there are instances where that is going on, and, and, and you just, you can't be 100% sure. But you know, um, as a, from a prophylactic standpoint, how to be careful. I mean, I always just stick to the golden rules of don't be stupid. Don't write stupid emails. Don't be write stupid text messages. Don't go on WhatsApp, WeChat, whatever chat and say stupid things because that'll invite nothing more than government scrutiny um, if you're you're being surveilled and just be sensible, you know, and I hate to say go see counsel if you really think something's going on or you have a problem because many of the academics we encountered during the China initiative really didn't um, see counsel until too late in the sense that they already had been well under investigation and were being surveilled and what have you. In fact, the latest one that I got picked up on was talking to the spouse of an indicted academic and referring her to a counsel. And the humorous aspect of that story is I didn't find out about it till I had lunch with another lawyer in the same city who told me who ended up getting the case, the representation, not the one I recommended, but the second one I recommended told me over lunch that he saw my name in the discovery in the criminal case talking mm -hmm. to the wife. And he says to me, how come you recommended so-and-so ahead of me? <laughs> okay. He gave me a lot of heat because I recommended <laughs> this other lawyer first. And okay, I, said, Brian. I, said, Thank you. I said, Phil, let's not get into that. But Thank he's you. the one who told me that I was picked up in the discovery in the criminal case. And I never would have known if he hadn't told me. Uh, Brian yeah. and uh, Liza, actually, what happened to the good old fashioned Freedom of Information Act? Can we use that to get information whether or not we are under surveillance? What no. happened to Freedom of Information Act? 
There are a lot of exceptions under the Freedom of Information Act. And you, you, you cannot get that information. There. You cannot get that. There's there are probably multiple multiple exceptions oh, that would apply. All right. We have a question for Gan. How can the AAPI community ally ally with other communities that have been subject to surveillance, including Muslim communities, brown communities, and black communities? What can communities as a whole do to enforce our rights of privacy? Well, um, what I learned from my ordeal, and uh, also now I work uh, closely with, with the Asian American Scholar Forum, uh, which was launched after I was arrested. Uh, uh, I'm now a, a board member. And the, what we learned is that we must speak out, we fight for our rights, and we work with uh, see, uh, all the communities, uh, uh, right, uh, human rights communities uh, to fight for our rights. And what we learned for us, uh, the uh, the key uh, uh, words is that we need to have a seat at the table. When the decision are made, right? When the policy was set up, we need to have a voice heard. We need to be on the at the table. Yeah, that's a very good point. We need to speak up. We need to stand up, and we need to get organized to help each other. I we are almost out of time. We have one question. How, another question that I think may be uh, five more minutes from the end of the webinar. How about Ashley? Is Congress likely to enact reforms to Section 702? What are the hurdles to reforms? Yes, I think it is very likely that Congress enacts reforms to Section 702. And I think it's going to address, um, first and foremost, this problem of backdoor searches, which Liza explained so eloquently at the outset of today's presentation. So just to remind everyone, the targets under Section 702 are technically non-U.S. persons abroad, but the government sweeps in the, their communications with Americans, and then it goes back through its databases without a warrant and deliberately looks for Americans' communications in those databases. And that searching for Americans' communications after the fact is called the backdoor search. And that is something that is just so blatantly unconstitutional. Um, I think I think uh, we are in a really good position to, to get reforms there. Um, in addition, Liza mentioned the scope of the surveillance. You know, it's incredibly broad, and we are optimistic that we are going to be able to rein in the scope of the surveillance as well. Liza is more steeped on the day-to-day -day lobbying, so she may have other thoughts on likely reforms and hurdles. I'll turn it over to her. Liza? Sure. I mean, I think some of the other ones we haven't really had much of a chance to talk about, so I hate to kind of throw a lot of confusing information at people, but there are a lot of loopholes that we worry um, that the that the government could get around restrictions that we put on 702 by using other authorities, by kind of migrating their surveillance uh, tactics to other authorities once there are hurdles put up to Section 702 surveillance to backdoor searches, et cetera. So there are various provisions that we are advocating to try to seal off these kind of escape routes and these, these workarounds. Um, and I, I guess I won't go into detail because it can get very technical, but that is a whole category of reforms we're looking for. Um, what I would love to say, because I know we're sort of moving towards closing remarks, is that people are not helpless in this debate at all. And in it, the sort of just average people who are kind of learning about this and, and are worried about it can actually have a tremendous effect by picking up your phone and calling your member of Congress. And I know that sounds almost Pollyanna-ish, but I was a staff member for a senator um, on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And when people called up, picked up the phone and made a call, it got attention. In this day and age where people do everything sort of on social media and by email, picking up the phone and making a call it gets attention. You can also write a letter to the editor, to your local newspaper. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. It will get attention. You can uh, try to get involved with local organizations that might be working on this, on these types of issues. So there are all kinds of ways that, that people can get involved and really help to make a difference in this debate where we really do have an opportunity uh, to rein in this surveillance. Liza, you made a very good closing remarks on behalf of all of us get involved and as we um, as I said in the beginning of our webinar this is a very complicated subject and we have just touched the surface there's so many issues so many cases that we just don't have time to get into 
But what Liza said is exactly what we all need to do. We need to call, we need to get active, we need to do everything we can so that when Section 702 comes to its conclusion this year, December 31, 2023, we will get some real, real meaningful changes. Don't forget Congresswoman Jerry Paul is the first one to get hold of because she made a commitment to us publicly. Well, I want to close by also thanking our sponsors. There are some, these are great organizations, Asian American Scholar Forum, AASF, American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, APA Justice, Brandon Center for Justice, and the Committee of 100. And I want to thank each and every one of our great speakers for making this webinar so interesting, so successful, and so challenging in terms of what we need to do before December 31, 2023. Thank you everybody for participating with us in this seminar and webinar. Bye everybody.